Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 55, I live it on. 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 55 through 58. When you're there, say amen. So that we may know what Jesus did and know who we are. Father, I thank you for we are the products of a finished work. Father, I thank you because we are born again. I thank you because we are filled with the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for we are your temple. For you cleaned us, you washed us, you made us new. We love you, we bless you, we give you the glory, honor, and all the praise. And if you love the Lord, shout amen. 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 The Bible says, O death, where is your steed? O Hades, where is your victory? You know, sometimes when we go through life as believers, we face things where we feel like we are being defeated. How many of you have ever gone through something as a believer and felt like you've been defeated or you're getting, you're getting hit or you're getting attacked and you're getting pinned on by the enemy? I came to tell somebody today that the enemy does not got power over your life. The enemy cannot dictate your life. The enemy cannot dictate your future because the power that he had was broken on that cross. And the Bible says here, oh man, where is your steam? In other words, how many of you have ever been bit by, uh, stung by a bee? We're praying for this morning. No more bees. Amen. Why are we afraid of the bee? Because it's stinging, right? And if you don't know, if a bee stings you, not shortly after that, they die because they lose their steam. That's their only defense, right? The enemy is a bee without a sting. Come on. So why are we afraid? He, he's no different than a fly. You see, when a bee comes around, we get scared and we start swinging and start running, start, start losing everything. But when a fly comes in, we just roll down the window. God's going to give you a new definition of the enemy so that you don't see him as a bee with a sting, but you see him as a bee without a sting. So even if he shows up in your car, you won't have fear. Even if he shows up around you, you won't have fear. Let, 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 me, let me bring it so that you can understand. Even if your kids start acting out, you won't have fear. Even if your family starts acting out, you won't have fear. Even if your body starts acting out, you won't have fear. Because he might be around you, but he no longer has the power to put something inside of you. Jesus took that sting for me. Jesus. 
the enemy has lost his power, the only thing he can do is bring fear. Why? Because he, he flies around like he still got it. He flies around like, like he still got it. But, it. but if we were to believe, well, wait a second, the pressure you can no longer affect me. Anxiety, you can no longer affect me. Yeah, you might be around here still, and yes, I might still gotta get you out of here, and yes, I might have to buy a little salt gun and, and for, you know what I'm saying? Put up with some kosher salt and start, start aiming and shooting, but I know now that you might be around me, but it doesn't mean you can get in me any longer. Depression has lost its power over your life. Anxiety has lost its power over your life. Fear and insecurity has lost its power over your life. I said sin has lost its power over your life. Oh, grave, where is your victory? Not just sin, but the grave has been defeated in the next verse. The Bible says this. It's very beautiful what he says. 56. Are we here? The Bible says the sting of death is what? Sin. So the, the enemy came as a bee, and he had one chance to sting somebody. He had one chance and one opportunity to sting somebody. And the Bible says that that sting is what? Sin. Which is death. We know that sin leads to death. Someone took death for you. Someone jumped in the line of fire for you. And the strength of sin is the law. Next verse. And the Bible says, but thanks be to God. Look at your neighbor and say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Why? Which has given us what? Victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The reason why we can have victory today, because he defeated the enemy on the cross. The reason why we can have victory today is because he took the sting of sin on the struggling with what you've been battling with, even young youth, you struggle, you battle, I know, it's hard, it's really hard, 
It sucks? Yes, it sucks. Is it fair? No, it ain't fair. But there's a solution to your problem, and his name is Jesus. Yeah. There's a solution for what you're going through, and his name is Jesus. And he doesn't care if you put yourself there. He's the type of God that will go into the highways and the byways. He'll go in the crack house. He'll go in the drug deal. He'll go in the prostitute. He'll go everywhere they're not supposed to go and take that steam for you. Why? Because he loves you, and he doesn't want you to live infected. Yeah. He's defeated. The enemy. So because he's defeated the enemy, I have the victory. Someone say, I have the victory. Aye. Somebody say, I have the victory. Aye. Now, I don't know what you've really been struggling with, but I need you to look at that thing you've been struggling with and tell it you no longer got power over me. I got the victory through Jesus Christ. Amen. Try to help somebody today. So, oh, death, where was your sting? Well, Hades, where was your victory? Why? Because the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is what? Who said that? That's my book. So <laughs> the strength of sin is what? Yeah. The law. The law, which is the old covenant. And that's the reason why in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, do not think that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. No, I did not come to destroy it. He says, but I come to fulfill it. Amen. What does that mean? That means Jesus came to fulfill what we can never fulfill in ourselves. Yeah. Jesus lived a perfect life. He was a sinless man. He did not sin once. He fulfilled every single law of the prophets and the law of Leviticus. He fulfilled everything, every single day of his life. He did not sin. He was the only one that God could look at and say, that's my righteous son. There's no sin in him. He's without spot. He's without blemish. He's perfect. He's pure. He lived a sinless life. He was pure. He was clean. That's the only way you can fulfill the law. Apart from Christ, we cannot be good in ourselves, church. We are not good within ourselves. We struggle. We battle the nature of sin. Still wants to show up sometimes. And bad fruit wants to affect the good fruit. And we have one good day, two good days, and then we have three bad days in a row. I, I cannot tell somebody today that, that those bad days. Like this. 
Because Jesus took that sin off your life. Amen. Jesus took that sin off your life. Jesus carried that sin and put it upon himself. And when he died, he went to heaven and he presented himself as a sacrifice. The Lamb of God, he prepared himself a sacrifice for the Father so that the Father can receive him as a perfect sacrifice and say, I forgive the sins of the world. Not only does he forgive the sins of the world, he forgets the sins of the world. Because sometimes we can be forgiven, but we still remember. We remember what God does. It. The Bible says that he takes your sin, he throws it where? In the middle, in the deepest parts. Let me tell you something. We've only discovered about 10% of the ocean. There's parts in there our technology cannot even go down to. Let me tell you, that's where your sin's at. That's where your sin's at. And he's not bringing it up for nobody. In fact, the Bible says, who can bring the charge against the elect of God? In other words, who can find the evidence that you are a sinner now today? The Bible says not one. I don't know if any of you ever been in court. Ever. <laughs> ever fought with the fear of, I mean, just. You know, you go to court and you know what you got caught up for, but there's still a lot of things that you should have got caught up for. And you're in there like, okay, I know I got caught up for this, but I hope that that doesn't come up or that doesn't come up or, or there's more added to the discovery. Y'all know what I'm talking about here. The Bible says, because the blood has washed you and cleansed you and freed you from all your transgressions and cleaned you from all your sin. You can stand before the judge and the father can look at you and say, you are innocent. But the enemy will come up and try to bring evidence. He says, no, case closed. He does that for you. Look at your neighbor and say, case closed. Case closed. Jesus closed the case of sin for your life. When he died on that cross, when they hung him high and they stretched him wide, when he was bleeding and bruised and mocked and made fun of, when he made a, a public spectacle for the whole world to see, when, when they grabbed a spear and stabbed him in, in, in his side, when, when they beat on him and they spit on him and they mocked him, he did all of that because he loves you. So that you don't have to live with the fear of that bee coming back and stinging you. Why? Because the moment they poked him, that bee stung him. And that stinger has been laid on the altar in heaven. Whew. That stinger has been laid in the altar of heaven. So that means sin no longer got power over your life. Does that mean you're never not going to sin? No. But that means you are no longer bound to the nature of sin. That means now you are born again, and you can now live in the nature of Christ, which is the divine nature, which you can produce the fruit of the Spirit by being intimate and governed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Amen. The Bible says this in Romans 8, 35 through 37. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Let, let me tell you something. The Father went, went out of his way to send his Son for you when you didn't even know him. Woo! The Father went out of his way and sent his son for you when you were stuck in your sin. The Bible says, when we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus didn't die for you because you were perfect. In fact, Jesus died for you because you were a mess. Jesus died for you because you were broken. Jesus died for you because you were lost. Jesus died for you because you were addicted. I talk to my cousins all the time and my friends all the time, and they tell me, well, maybe, you know, I'm just not worthy to go to church. I said, friend, you got it all wrong. Jesus didn't die for you because you were worthy. He died for you because you weren't worthy. He didn't die for you because you were good. He died for you because you were bad. So you are the perfect candidate to receive the grace of God over your life. It's not because we're good. It's because we were bad. It's because we broke the law that we were selected. How many of us have ever broken the law before? Uh, you are the perfect candidate for the grace of God. Say amen. Amen. So who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, shall distress, shall persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are all killed all day long. Look at your neighbor and say, deny your flesh. 
No, no, no. Apostle Paul says, I die daily. Look at your neighbor and say, kill your flesh. Kill your. Every time your flesh tries to come up, you gotta kill that thing. Every time your flesh tries to pop up, you gotta lay it on the altar. Every time your flesh tries to pop up, you gotta start speaking in tongues and shake it up. For your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. The Bible says this is very powerful. It says, yet in all these things, we are what? More than conquerors to him who loved us. Amen. Now, we know what a conqueror is. But do we know what more than a conqueror is? A conqueror is one who goes out and fights and takes territory. Right? But someone who's more than a conqueror is someone who didn't fight the fight but reaps the benefits of the victory that, from that fight. Someone who's more than a conqueror is someone he, who didn't go out to battle, who didn't dress up, who didn't fight, but receives the victory from that fight. Amen. You weren't on that cross, but you received the victory from that battle. Amen. Amen. You weren't the one getting whipped, man of God, but you received the victory from every lash. Amen. Come on. Come on. You weren't carrying that cross, walking up Calvary. No, it wasn't. But you received the victory from every step that he ever took. He, was, he gives you his victory. Even when you didn't share in it. But we share in it today. Shout out to the youth for bringing the trophy home in the bottom of the Can we give it up for the youth one time? Wave at me for a moment, amen. You guys are all champions in Jesus' name, amen. You guys are all champions in Jesus' name. Now, if you know anything about sports, um, there's a few good ones and there's a few ones I've never played before, bro. <laughs> They're hitting the ball and it's going backwards in Jesus' name. But sometimes when you got good players on your team, they, 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 they say that you're carrying the team, right? Because you're good even though they're not as good, but you still carry the team. You, you're doing everything you can. You're diving, you're hitting it with your head, your shoulder, whatever you gotta do to get that ball over the net. Whatever you gotta do to be victorious, right? Yeah. Right. Now, they received the trophy, amen? Encounter youth received the trophy. Now, it's not the ones that hit the ball over that receives the victory. But it's every single person that is a part of that team receives the victory. Amen. There might even be some that didn't even play, but the fact that they were there and a part of a team means that they share in that victory. In other words, I don't care if you didn't spike the ball. I don't care if you couldn't surf it over the net. I don't care if you didn't die. If you want to prop back that trophy, then that victory belongs to you. That means you got pride. You
is that that bee has lost its sin. That means sin can no longer affect your life. That means depression has lost its power. Fear has lost its power. Anxiety has lost its power. Not because you played a good game, but because he did. Not because you were, you know, but because he did. And I was in prayer the other day, in between jobs at work and just going in. The Lord, the Lord spoke to me during my daily encounter. He, he broke something inside of me in a good way. I was in prayer and I was just going in and I was like, God, I don't want to be seen by man. I want to be seen by you. I was like, God, I don't want to win man's heart. I want to win your heart. He said, son, stop there. How can you win what Jesus already won for you? He says, you got to stop trying to win me over when you already have me. It's just for you to sit there and, try and say you want to win my heart tells me you don't have a clear understanding of the gospel. You don't have a clear understanding of what my son did on that cross for you. He said, I want to bring you into this place where you know who he is so you can know who you are. So that you won't allow those, you know, I wouldn't say false revelation, but just that moment of just growing and just laying it down, but, but we need to come to this place where we know what Jesus did on that cross for us and as us, and that same power is still at work in us and through us. Amen. See, God, I want to win your heart. He said, stop there, son. How can you win when my son already gave you? How many of us try to look good and perform good and to be seen by him, and he says, hey, I'm not worried about you trying to do something out of the ordinary to catch my attention. You already have my attention. You already have all of me. You don't need to try to be good and be this perfect person and do all these beautiful things to have me. He says, my son paid that price on that cross, but I can live inside of you. You already have me. He says, so stop trying to impress me and live like you already got me. I pulled my truck over. I got completely wrecked. And I believe that in that moment, God freed me from myself. Amen. And he still freed me from myself Amen. in that revelation. Because in order for us to live a spirit-filled life here, a spirit-filled church, we cannot live a life trying to be in, in a performance or in a competition with him or her to be seen by him. You, you already are seen by him. You already have his heart. You already have his word. You already have his spirit. There's nothing more you can do to make him love you anymore. He already loves you. So I believe that we must grow in revelation and clarity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that we can walk in complete freedom and liberty and live a spirit-filled life. Are you with me, church? Yes. So I'm going to be going over a, about three steps to live a spirit-filled life. This is what God gave me for us tonight. I said everything to say this. Going over three steps of ways to live a spirit-filled life. And this is what I believe God is breathing on for us here today because he doesn't want us, he doesn't want to continue to see us to be afraid of a bee without a stinger. Because that's what we look like as believers. Sometimes that's what we look like as believers when we, we act like we forget who God is. We act like we serve a defeated God. He is not a defeated God. He is victorious and he is sovereign and he, he owes everything. ways. The, the first step is very simple. Is we must believe and receive the gospel by grace. We must believe and receive the gospel of grace. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 
through 10, we must believe and receive the gospel by grace. Because too many times we receive it by grace, but we try to still work for it. It's like someone getting paid for working five hours, but staying on the clock trying to work 10 hours for that five hour pay. Not me, but you've got to get the wrong way. <laughs> But the Bible says here, for by grace you are saved. Say, by grace, by grace. I am, I am saved. saved. I am saved. I am saved. I am saved. That's a resurrected ministry. Like, share, share, subscribe. <laughs> Jesus. But the Bible says, for by grace you are saved. Look at your neighbor and, and just tell them real quick, hey, you're not going to be saved. You are saved. Because saved is a past tense word, means it already happened. The e the e d at the end, the suffix at the end of saved determines the tense of that word, and that word is a past tense word, meaning you're not gonna be saved by grace. You already are saved. And if you look at the definition of the word saved, it's so so in the Greek. It means to be delivered. It means to be healed. It means to do well. It means to be preserved. It means to be whole. Are you with me here? So this means every area and every branch of that word so so in the Greek it means you already are. It means God already put it inside of you. Because salvation is not a package deal. Salvation is not a subscription where you pay more, you get more. No, he already paid for it. You get it in full. You get the whole package, baby. You don't have to sit around and wait and be a year member to get the upgrade like Costco cards. No, you need credit cards, amen? No, no, no. When you get saved, you receive salvation. You get the full package. The full head of the God here. Part of me down on the inside of you. Amen. It says through what? Father loves you. Yes. Do you believe the Father sent His Son to die on that cross? Yes. Not just for the sins of the world, but for your sins. Yes. And you believe that, that by grace you have been saved. Yes. Come on. And sometimes it's not just a prayer, it's not a declaration, but it's grabbing this revelation and saying, God, help me to live like this is real. Yes. It's getting inside the Word until the Word gets inside of you and that seed begins to grow and bear fruit. That fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Say, by grace we have been saved through faith, and that is not of what? It's not by your talents. It's not by your gifts. It's not by your credit score. It's not by how good you look, Jacob. Come on, somebody. It's not how good that beard looks for you. That is clean. It's coming in nice, right? It's not by any of that. It's not by yourself. In other words, you did nothing to receive this in your own ability. This is a free gift God has given you by His grace. Woo! This is a free gift he has given you by his grace. In other words, he's not looking at your performance to see if you're qualified to receive salvation. Because the one who performed it was his son. Amen. Your performance don't get you in. No matter God, your performance ain't going to get you up. Because the same power that brought you in is the same power that's going to keep you. The same grace that brought you in is the same grace that's going to keep you. Because grace is just not receiving what you don't deserve, but it's the ability to continue to live in that place. Amen. Woo! Yeah. Are we here? Yeah. It is not of ourselves. It is what? A gift. How many of you like receiving gifts? Amen. 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 Gift is one of my love languages for you people that, that don't know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's, I don't know why. That's just the way the Lord wired me. <laughs> and it, it's one of my love language. <laughs> but no greater love is this. Someone who lay their life down for a friend. The greatest gift we can ever receive is the gift of Christ. I know some of you like Louis, like Gucci, praise the Lord, and we, we receive those gifts and give the name. But none of those gifts, none of those gifts will ever outweigh the gift of Christ. Amen. You can have all the money, have all the riches, have all the houses, have all the cars, have all the guns, and have all the stuff, and still be empty, and still be whole, and still be, still be broken. You can have nothing, and have him, and you have nothing. Next 
verse. He says, it's not of works, not, not of works, least any man should boast. And, and this is what my prayer was like in, when I was having my daily encounter. I was trying to work to be seen by him. I was trying to work to win his heart. Even though I already had him, I was talking to him like I did. I was praying to him, Brother Eddie, like if I didn't have him. That was me trying to work to get him. How many times do we as believers pray to him like he's not in the room? Sing to him, worship him like he's not in the room. There's a song that Pastor Linda sings, I don't want to talk about you like you're not in this room. Because I know you are. When you're in your prayer time in your car, he's with you. When you're in your secret place, he's with you. Talk to him like he's there because he is. It is not of our works, least any man should boast. And in other words, we come to Christ, yes, we receive his, his grace, yes, but we have gifts and we have talents, and that's beautiful. But those gifts and talents mean nothing and this oil ain't on them. Because our gifts don't intimidate the devil. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. Yes. And the secret sauce can only be given to you in the secret place. Amen. Amen. Put that on the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Next verse, and it's on there. <laughs> it gets better than the pipe. It says, for we are his workmanship. Yeah. Yeah. That means that even though we don't receive it by grace, we still can't work in perfection for it. It's him that is still working at it in us. We can't get away from him. He paid for us. He, he, he saves us. He tells us not by, by our abilities or our performance or our works. And then he doesn't let us go. He says, but it's still going to be for me working it in you. He said, it's still going to be working it in you. It's still going to be me working it in you. It's not you, it's me. Sometimes we try so hard to work for him instead of working from him. He says, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has ordained that we should walk in them. Say, walk in them. Walk. This is how we live a spirit-filled life. Not just live in the spirit, but we must also walk in the spirit. The first step is believing and receiving the gospel. The next step, chapter uh, uh, point two, is to live from God's perspective of us and not our own. This is something that we all struggle with. Is living from God's perspective of us and not our own. We come to Christ, receive the gospel, we get born again, right? And now what God wants to do in your alone time with him is define you and affirm you. It's to reveal to you who you are because of Jesus. Reveal to you who you are, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, but today. Yeah. By his grace, regardless of what you think about yourself. Because once you get God's definition over you, everything the enemy has ever spoken over you loses power. I'll tell you why. Because when you know who you are, you know who you're not. And when you know who you're not, when who you're not shows up, you're able to tell them who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. So we must, the second point is live from God's perspective and, and, not, and not our own. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9 through 10, this is the Apostle Paul, he's writing to the Corinthian church. And I believe this is something that, that the Corinthian church was struggling with was believing they were good enough. Right? Because that's something that we still struggle with. Believing that we're good enough. Believing that we're worthy enough. Believing, understand, we're not worthy, we're not good enough by ourselves. It is in Him. Right? Amen. The Apostle Paul said this, and this is very powerful. I hope you listen to this. He says, For I am the least of the apostles who am not even worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God 
which was with me. Apostle Paul told them, I am not worthy to be an apostle. I persecuted the church. The blood of Stephen is on my hands. I hurt people. I locked people up. I whipped people. I persecuted Jesus Christ. I am not worthy to even be called an apostle. If anything, I'm the least of the apostles. But he says this, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. There's going to be a moment in your life where you're going to allow who you've been and grace to fight. Who you've been, what you've done, everything you've ever committed, and grace are going to fight inside of your mind. This is what Apostle Paul was telling the Corinthian church. After everything I've done, my identity isn't found in what I've done. My identity is found in the grace of God. So my ability to be an apostle is not because of my abilities as a person. My ability to be an, an, an apostle is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, it's by the what, grace of God that I am what I am today. And then he says, he says this, he says, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Yet I labored more than abundantly. And he says, I'm not worthy to be carnal and apostle even though I do more than all of them. That's what he said. He said, even though I do more than all the other apostles, it's not me. It's the grace. Sometimes as workers and servants in the house, we have a list of all that we do. Don't get it mistaken. It's not you. It is the grace that is at work. Amen. And it is that grace that keeps you in identity. Because we are going to fight and we are going to struggle with who we were and who we are today because of him. That's the reason why the word of God is so, empower is so powerful for a believer. That's the reason why a believer who doesn't read their Bible is a believer who's lunch for the enemy. Oh, yeah. A believer who has their Bibles closed has the keys to the mansion but don't know how to use them. A believer who has the Bible closed is strong in moments, but like a light, they flicker. A believer who is in their word goes from just having moments with God to a life with him. Are you with me? He didn't die so you can experience freedom for a moment. No, no, no. He wants you to experience freedom for life. Amen. Why? Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Freedom. So the Holy Spirit lives where? Where does the Holy Spirit live? Yeah. How? Because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, the Holy, so if the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, wherever the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. We should be experiencing freedom in our life every single day. But the problem is we only have moments. Why? Because our Bibles are we got to get into the Word so the Word gets inside of us so that when, when who we used to be shows up, we can stand firm in our identity in Christ. In our, in our identity in Christ that we didn't earn, sister. We received it by the grace of God. Come on. Are you with me? Yeah. Now we have number three, which is the last one. And I think this one is for every single one of us here. It says, live from Jesus' abilities and not our own. Live from Jesus' abilities and not our own. Because sometimes we try to do things in our own strength. Sometimes we try to do things in our own wisdom. Sometimes we try to do things in our own might. That's when our marriages start struggling. That's when our households start struggling. When we, when we have Jesus be a part of it and not the center, right? We must have Jesus be the center of our marriages if we want our marriages to be kingdom marriages. We must have Jesus be the center of our home if we want to have kingdom homes. He just can't be a part of it. He, he, he just can't be a caption on Instagram. He just can't be something cute you put on a shirt. He must be the foundation to which you build your house upon. Come on. Yeah. Come on. We must stop living from our own abilities because let me tell you something. I can never be good enough for him. I can never be good enough. I can never be strong enough. I can never preach good enough. I can never be anointed enough for him. It's not by my abilities, by his. So I don't live for him, I live from him. And because I live from him, I'm able to live for him. 
The Bible says in Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things. All things. Through who? Christ. Who strengthens me. Listen, you can't do it in your own strength. You can try. God bless you, Brother Charlie. You can try, and you might hold it for a little bit. But let me tell you something. Weight gets heavier over time. It could be the same amount of weight, but the longer you hold it, the heavier it gets. Y'all with me? We cannot do it in our own abilities. And he never asked us to to begin with. He said, hey, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take up home my burden, because yours is heavy and mine is light. Your yoke is hard. My yoke is easy. He never intended for us to do it ourselves. He said, come to me. He doesn't tell us to leave. He says, come to me. He never told us to leave. He says, come to me. He never told us to leave. What does that mean? That means it must stay close to Jesus. Because when I'm close to him, let me tell you something. That weight is is light. When I'm close to him, my yoke is easy for me to receive. What used to be hard in my marriage has become a blessing. Why? Because when I'm close to him, it becomes, I wasn't really a very strong communicator when it came to my marriage or in a relationship. I was the type that wrapped in confrontation. I was the type that you, you, that we have a discussion like, all right, cool. What you want? What you want? I'm going to just do whatever I want to do there. That was me, BC. <laughs> Before Christ. <laughs> Sometimes I want to show up. Now, as the man, as the husband, as the pastor of my wife, and not a pastor here, but a pastor in my house, I must discern and know when there's a snake trying to show up. Come on. I must fight and protect my family. I must stand there for my wife. I must be there. And, and I can't allow my flesh to be the dividing factor of our conversations. That was a fight for me at first because I grew up my whole life like that in a relationship. You didn't want it. That's cool. Whatever. Next. That was That's how I grew up. I struggled with that. Right? I just shut off. Okay, cool. Boom. Wall. Right? And that was me. But now I have a wife that wants to talk to me. <laughs> God knows what he's doing, man. God knows what he's doing. You know what the about? He wants to talk to people. But I need that. I need that because she completes me in that. She completes me because wives are a gift to us. She helps me in areas where I can't. I'm struggling with them. It's, I'm hard on myself, right? She helps me in areas. So now I know that I can't rely on my own, you know, what, charisma, you know what I'm saying? My own, like, understanding to try to be that husband to her, I gotta rely on Christ. Amen. It doesn't mean to come to him, you know, whenever you need strength and say, no, some of us need to learn how to talk to our wives. Amen. And wives, you need to learn how to honor your husbands. Amen. But husbands, you need to learn how to honor your wives. Amen. You gotta learn how to love your wife. You have to learn her love language. Come on now. Don't stop dating. Come on, are we here? Don't stop falling in love. It, it grows. It grows. It grows. It's a garden. Your, your, your marriage is a garden. What does it look like? Come on, somebody. Come on. It's our responsibility. But understand, it's our responsibility. That we can't do it from our own abilities. Because we're so quick to respond to the flesh. Are you with me here today? I feel like you're yeah. It's so easy to respond in the flesh. And even if you do respond in the flesh, be quick to forgive. Be quick to repent. Because we're grown. I might not have the conviction in that moment, but when I'm walking around to the other room, oh, my stomach starts turning. And the Holy Spirit starts talking to me. Go repent. It's not even my fault. I'm carrying your peace me. That's the evidence of the Son. A child is being a peacemaker. He says, here, you want to carry my nature? Be a peacemaker. Because you'll never be more publicly anointed than you are privately consecrated. My ministry will never go beyond the beauty of my marriage. 
right? For anybody here in ministry, for anybody here growing, or your, your marriage is your second ministry. Your first is God's. Second is your marriage. Third is assembly, church. We must stop relying on our own wisdom, our own understanding, our own knowledge. I get it. There's people that are smart out there. I get it. There's people that have good terminology. I get it. But if it's not Bible, don't build your house on it. If it's not Bible, don't build your house on it. Because I'll tell you something. Your house will never fail if it's built on the rock. Your house will never fail if it's built on the rock. And if you build your house on the sand, there's an expiration date for how long it stands. But we must stop relying on our abilities. And this is step three. Is start relying on, on his abilities. Because the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.18, it says, For Christ also suffered once for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Jesus died so he can bring you to God and not just bring you to him, but keep you with him. Georgie said something so powerful last Sunday when he preached, and I don't even think it was part of his preaching and message. It was just something that just flowed out of him. He says, when you meet God, God comes to you. But if you still want to meet with God, you got to go to him. He said, when Moses had an encounter with God, God met, God, made, God met with Moses on the mountain. Right. Whenever Moses wanted to have an encounter with God, he had to go back to the mountain. Right? God, Jesus died to bring us to God. Now it's our determination, our love towards him that bring us and keep us with him. Are you with me? Yeah. It says, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the the spirit. Jesus is alive in the spirit. And I was going to Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 14. I'm going to close with this. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 14. I'm going to close with this. The Bible says, And do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through the baptism his death, that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. I'm going to say that one more time. Knowing that our old man was crucified with him. I'm going to say that for you to understand. Knowing that the old Matthew was crucified with him. I'm going to say it for you to understand. Knowing that the old Adrian was crucified with him. I'm going to say it for you to understand. Knowing that the old Jacob was crucified with him. I'm going to say it one more time. Knowing that the old Guillermo was crucified with him. Right? That the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves of sin. Are you with me? I'm just reading the Bible to you. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ... Having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. Amen. Woo. When Jesus died for sin, he died once and for all. That doesn't mean you can go live the way you want to live. Because the Bible says in the book of, of, of Hebrews that if you receive the grace of God and you receive the knowledge of Christ and still continue to sin, there's no more need for a sacrifice for your life. If you sin willfully after receiving the grace, hey, there's no more need for... Now, understand, this is to put fear in your heart. That's why the writer of Hebrews is to put fear in your heart to keep you in the fear of the Lord to live. In the righteousness of Christ. 
Are you with me? It says, for the death that he died, he died for sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to who? To who? To who? One more time, to who? He lives to God. Now, likewise, you also, now I'm talking to you, likewise, you also, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law. You are under grace. Let us stand to our feet. Death no longer has dominion over you. Sin no longer has dominion over you. You have been made free in Christ. And receive the victory from the, the battle that he fought on that cross. Now what does that mean for you? That when we believe and receive the gospel. We become saved. But when we apply the word of God to our lives. We work out our salvation. It's not enough to just be saved. We must work out our salvation. That doesn't mean we work for our salvation. We work from our salvation. We don't work for our salvation. Oscar, it means we work from our salvation. That means everything we do flows from our position in Christ. 